Hi, I'm Laura Flanders of The Laura Flanders Show, back with you coming from Common Bound, Common Bound 2016 in Buffalo, New York, streaming live courtesy of Truthout. Thank you all our friends at Truthout. We're talking to people behind the scenes who've come to this conference about their work and what they see happening in this whole field. And our next guest is Anthony Flacavento. He's the author of a brand new book that does just the sort of thing I love, which is tell up from the bottom stories and puts them in national context. The book is Building a Healthy Economy from the Bottom Up, Harnessing Real World Experience for Transformative Change. Anthony's a farmer, he once made a run for office, he's an activist, and he's made a huge difference in his part of the world in Appalachian, Virginia. Anthony, welcome to the program. Welcome. So glad to be here, Laura. It's glad to have you at Common Bound. Yeah, oh, it's been exciting. What an amazing conference. Tell yeah. me why you decided to come. Well, you know, uh, two things. One is I had met some folks uh, from a distance at Common Bound when we organized the Appalachian New Economy Week last fall. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, these, these uh, young people, it was mostly young people, really have a tremendous uh, smarts and energy at the same time. So I thought I wanted to get more involved. So, yeah. so there is a new economy for Appalachia after coal? There is an emerging, struggling to emerge new economy. I mean, we're sort of, you know, 15, 20 years ago, there was the post-tobacco agricultural economy, which we've been fairly successful in cultivating. It's a lot more complicated and difficult to have a broader post-coal economy, but the elements of it are beginning to surface and emerge. Yeah. So talk a little bit more about that. You were very deeply involved in that transition from tobacco um, to organics and, and sustainable farming. What have you learned in that experience that is relevant to this period now? Yeah, for one, I think, uh, at least in Appalachia, but uh, my experience more broadly, I think rural people generally, they want to see uh, a concrete, tangible alternative. The, the talk um, is pretty exhausting to them, and those of us in the progressive movement tend to talk a hell of a lot. So <laughs> one thing we tried to do and had some success with was rather than doing much talking, we just started doing stuff. Like what? And so, for instance, we started a farmer's market, and then another farmer's market, and another farmer's market. And then we started an aggregation and distribution system, what's now called a food hub, back uh, in 1999-2000, to create market opportunities for tobacco farmers to shift organic produce and free-range eggs and the like. And we did similar things in sustainable forestry and wood products, sort of a vertically integrated community-based wood manufacturing. So in both of those cases, the farmers and the loggers and then the institutional people who were very skeptical about any alternatives, once we actually had stuff on the ground and it was kind of working, it was a little bit easier to bring more folks on board and to fight the notion that nothing is possible except tobacco. Now we have the nothing but coal and, and we're trying to do the same thing. Well, your relationship with the coal industry goes back a long time too and with tr the coal unions, the mm. mine workers. Exactly. How come you're not persona non grata among coal miners? I sure am among coal executives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when I ran for Congress, that was a very clear differential. The miners, I was part of the Pitts and Coal Strike in 1989, uh, 1990, and was at the front lines day after day in the really extensive nonviolent civil disobedience that was going on. That eventually the UMWA more or less won that fight after a really difficult year. Well, 25 years later when I ran, ran for Congress, it was amazing how the miners and their wives and widows remembered me. Yeah. And what they were nervous about was the idea that there needed to be something other than coal and that the environment needed to be protected and preserved. But the bonds around labor and protection of labor and fighting for black lung and minor safety and whatnot were enough to open the door uh, for me to be able to kind of win them over for mm. you know support. I you did choose to run for office, why? Because uh, I felt like my life wasn't adding up to squat. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that pretty much every day. But I thought um, the local work was great. I was doing it. I met lots of colleagues through Bali and through the Kellogg Network, et cetera. And I was amazed by the body of uh, innovative local economy work, local food work, local justice work happening all over the country. And uh, But I was also aware that even though there was this incredible stuff happening, it seemed like at the level of public discourse, the media, and public policy, we were spitting in the wind. We were just too small or too disconnected to make a difference. So 
I ran for Congress thinking maybe I can lift those examples, lift those stories up a little more. And what year was that? 2012. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't get elected. I did not. I got 39.5% of the vote, about 114,000 people. But interestingly, I mean, basically, I got my ass kicked. But, but interestingly, I did much better in the coal counties. Mm -hmm. I got between 42 and 47% of the vote in the counties that were most hurting, that had the highest percentage of working folks, all that. There is a party now that's sprung up in your part of the world called the Mountain Party. Yeah. Can you tell us anything about that? Well, I don't know much except that I think that you could – well, here's what I, what I think because I haven't looked into them yet – is that they're um, modeling themselves to some degree after the Working People's Party but with a place-based mm -hmm. focus, you know, really. And, and which fits with the economic kind of – the new economy we're trying to Im, uh, get to emerge there, which is all around what are the assets of our place, mm -hmm. our mountain streams, farmland – cultural heritage, et cetera. Because what's so interesting to me, listening to you, and I've always found it when I went to Appalachia, is you come into the region that is so stereotyped as being stuck in the mud and right. old traditional and conservative yeah. and find actually a plethora of small projects, people trying to come up with alternatives, right, right. quite creative organizing against a fairly difficult scene. Absolutely. Um, but over it all, this land ownership problem right. of massive dominance by the coal and mineral companies. Absolutely. How do you make the kind of change that you're talking about while you have that kind of roof over your head? Yeah, it's or really, yeah, I mean, it's really tough because for, uh, for a tobacco farmer 20 years ago or for a coal miner or a laid off, more likely a laid off coal miner today, first of all, there's the, the sense that they've lost the fight. I mean, a lot of them just felt like they were sort of neglected, um, discarded by society. So there's the psychological component of it. But then the other thing is that until pretty recently, most of our communities really didn't have any of the infrastructure systems you need to transition. There was not the physical infrastructure to add value to farm and forest products. There was not the kind of social infrastructure the way there was around tobacco, mm -hmm. where the land grants and the extension service and the economic developers and the town officials all supported and enhanced tobacco. There was nothing like that for other things. There was no market access, not to our own communities, let alone to larger communities outside. So a lot of the work that has been going on the last 20 years is beginning to build out some of those pieces of kind of like community capital, you might call it. Including things like broadband. Including broadband, absolutely, which then cuts across all the economic sectors. And then some of the community capital is a packing house in, in uh, you know, Scott County, Virginia, for, for organic produce, whatever, things like mm -hmm. that. You, in the book, outline six transitions that you think would be a good you recommend six transitions that we need. Right. What are the six? I actually mandate them. They're mandatory, <laughs> Laura. Let's get that straight. <laughs> so the six transitions, four of them are kind of primarily economic in nature, and, and they're somewhat cumulative or sequential. The, the very first one that I think is profoundly important is a transition, what I call, from consumptive dependence to productive resilience, which is to say that, you know, going forward in, in 50 years, 20 years, we simply can't all live the way our generation mm -hmm. has lived. You mm -hmm. know, we have to be able to do more for ourselves closer to home. So it's a matter of retooling um, and rebuilding the capacity of families, households, and communities. So that's kind of the foundation of that. Then growing out of that is this movement from trickle down, which has been such an utter disaster everywhere, but in Appalachia for sure, um, to bottom up, to bottom up solutions, many of the kind of creative things. Mm -hmm. And I should say that the examples in the book aren't just Appalachian, they're from all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, then the third one is uh, around community capital, re rebuilding, or in some cases simply building for the first time, local wealth, physical wealth, uh, alternative financing. Again, to reinforce that emerging living economy, we need capital. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one is the kind of network idea. You know, the huge multinationals or transnationals, David corrects me, um, are all vertically and horizontally yeah. integrated. Well, we need to vertically and horizontally integrate as groups and as small businesses. And then the last two are a little different. One is about rekindling the public debate. So mm -hmm. it's about media and civic engagement, uh, about which I knew almost nothing but had people like you and Mimi Pickering and others to guide me. And then finally, um, through it all, is we've got to put policy behind yeah. this. So it's uh, rebuilding a politics 
of you know that cares about people from the bottom mm. I want you to we're running out of time but I want you to just end with some kind of life lessons I mean when you look at your farmers market in Abingdon the way it is now versus the way it started or when you look at these discussions with former coal industry workers um, what's been the grease on the wheels of some pretty tricky conversations. What mm. do you think has helped? You know, when you say life lessons, I want to go into my Don Corleone. <laughs> <laughs> Not that kind. <laughs> no dead horses. No, I guess for me that's the, um, so farmer's markets are, are probably a good metaphor for it. It's basically that I think there's a latent potential to rebuild our communities that uh, in a lot of rural places, and I'm sure a lot of cities too, folks have just given up on. And that tapping that means creating venues where people actually interact. Which is not to say that the virtual world is not uh, very important in all this, but really the physical place in the community where farmers and others can come and sell their stuff or other sorts of physical gathering places, we found to be one of the things that's utterly critical. The other is you gotta recognize that the, the mainstream response to all this is they want to have all of the above strategies. They want to promote a little bit of renewable but still do fossil fuels. They want to promote the local farmers markets but still support GMOs and, and Monsanto and all that. And the all of the above invariably favors the dominant yeah. status quo. And so really we need to make choices about which kind of development we want. There's a beautiful introduction to Anthony's book by Bill McKibben that talks about exactly that, the farmers markets that we need of all different sorts. Anthony, welcome. I mean. Thank you for oh, coming in. It's been I'm great having you. So great to be with you. Thanks, Laura. Watch more of the live stream right here from Common Bound 2016.